McCarthy believed he was a leader of a gang involved in stealing millions of pounds. In seven million pounds was taken when a security van was held up in Fairview during He's January. Suspected of involvement in the theft of over three million pounds taken in an armed raid on the Brinks Allied Security Depot in 1996. One of the Criminal Assets Bureau's first targets was the mastermind behind these high-profile robberies. That target was Jerry Hutch. The enigmatic gangster known as the Monk never did time behind bars for these heists, but he didn't get to keep all the loot either. It took over 10 years to piece together all the clues, but in the end, the Criminal Assets Bureau made him pay. The result was a multi-million euro bonanza for the public purse. Operation Alpha was the code name for the mission to seek and seize the criminal stash of Jerry Hutch, Ireland's number one armed robber. Operation Alpha was a bit like ripples on a pond. At the very centre was Jerry Hutch, the monk, and his gang of armed robbers. But as the inquiry spread out, more and more individuals were exposed and added to the hit list. One senior cop who kept a close eye on the career of Jerry Hutch was Felix McKenna. As head of the Criminal Assets Bureau, he would become the monk's nemesis. I was aware that Jerry Hutch was a, a gang boss from the inner city. He lived a kind of a sober lifestyle. According to the intelligence, he never drank, and he was a non-smoker. He came from a large family in the inner city described as very hard times as a young boy. He left school early in life at about 13 or 14 years of age and got himself involved with a gang of young individuals in the inner city, commonly known and written about in the newspapers at the time as the Bugsy Malones. A handful of mere children have scandalized this country with their lawlessness. They become known, perhaps unfortunately, as the Bugsy Malone gang. Well, what about stolen goods in the area? Well, how do you get rid of them? You, you get a boy all right. He says, I'll buy this off you, then you go and get it. And then you get it, and then he buys it off you. Have you any trouble finding people in the area to buy stuff off you? No, no trouble at all. Their MO was simple. They'd run into a bank, maybe four or five of them, with guns, leap over the counter, terrify the staff inside, grab whatever money was accessible to them and out the door, and disappear. In time, Hutch would build a formidable reputation as an elusive crime boss, but in his teenage years, he'd not been so clever. Reckless and careless, he was jailed a total of 11 times in the 1970s for burglary, joyriding, car theft, larceny and assault. While inside, he taught himself how to read and write and prepared himself for his career in life, crime. Going to Mount Joy for a criminal kid is like getting to third level college. They've no sense of shame in being in jail, where most families of whatever class would die of mortification. When I was on Dublin City Council and in my own constituency, I could see the absolute disregard they had for just ordinary, hard-working, working-class families. And I had no sentiment or concern about the niceties of life for these people. They were just baddies, as far as I was concerned. Hutch graduated from the Villains University with full honours. He used his liberty to hone his skills as an armed thief and stay out of the slammer. But the stakes for armed robbery were high. One slip and you could end up dead. A number of his associates, close associates that were involved with him in the gangs, were shot dead during robberies in the inner city by police officers who uh, confronted them during the robberies. He then more or less changed his M.O. and uh, became very, very secretive in what he did. Jerry Hutch adopted a complete change of attitude, go on no robbery unless it was well planned. He became one of those masterminds of uh, planning robberies. It took a long time doing the intelligence on, for argument's sake, security vans or security depots. He had a, a cunning criminal brain. As the years progressed, Jerry Hutch himself plus a number of the inner circle worked building up the intelligence and the timing of when deliveries would be made to certain institutions and where vans would be at a particular time. (laughs) 
Over the years, Hutch would lose several accomplices to drug overdoses, gangland feuds, and forceful Garda action. But three men have been at his side for most of his criminal career. This trusted inner circle includes William Scully, an old Bugsy Malone who was game for anything. Paul Boyle, another risk taker who prospered under Hutch and specialized as a bike man. And Jeffrey Ennis, an ace car thief and a speedy getaway driver. All of these men were classified by Guard Intelligence as armed, dangerous criminals. Jeffrey Ennis specialised in stealing cigarettes from around the docks. Jerry Hutch, through his association then with the street dealers and through some close criminal associates of his, the likes of Noel Duggan, known as Mr Kingsize, they were able to dispose of any stolen cigarettes on the open streets. As the years progressed, Jerry Hutch himself became a very complex character. He trusted very, very few people. That was his M.O. The less people who know your business, the safer you are. He was assisted by other masterminds who were very skilled at hiding monies and were in a position to advise him. Matt Kelly was a veteran Dublin criminal who specialised in racketeering and money laundering operations. Jerry Hutch had run errands for him when he was a young gurrier and looked up to Kelly. Now the kid was the talk of the town and needed his old mentor to do him a favour. Kelly, in turn, was in cahoots with an armed robber turned property developer called Paddy Shanahan. Shanahan laundered money through a variety of commercial fronts and dodgy businessmen. But he was an unusual figure. From a respectable background and with a university education, Shanahan got involved in crime for the fun of it. In January of 1987, a Securi Corps van transporting a large amount of cash across Dublin was ambushed in Merino on the city's north side by a group of armed and masked men. They forced the security men out of the van, drove the van to Griffith Avenue, where they emptied it of its contents. The contents amounted to almost £1.5 million. This was the largest cash robbery that had ever taken place in Ireland. Therefore, the criminal gang responsible were now gone into a super league of uh, crime bosses. The success of the Marino Mart robbery presented a very real problem for Jerry Hutch. Where was he going to hide over one million pounds in cash? And the cops were watching his every move. He recruited two mules, Francis Joseph Sheridan and Lone and Patrick Hickey, both of whom were perfect for the job. Neither had a criminal record and they were desperate for money. Hutch would meet them at the halfway house pub on the Navan Road and hand over lumps of the Security Corps cash. It was taken north of the border to Newry and lodged in bank accounts opened by Hutch. But after a few runs, the cash moving operation was rumbled. Hutch's bagmen were arrested, charged, and subsequently convicted. But they were too scared to squeal on the ruthless crime boss. A file was sent to the DPP, but because Jerry Hutch was not directly identified by the two persons who had uh, handled the monies on his behalf, the DPP's hands were tied. There was no evidence to uh, bring a successful prosecution against him. This was the heyday of the thieves' paradise. Dangerous gangsters like the Monk were able to exploit a legal system tilted in favour of organised crime. In terms of armed robberies, if the Gardaí were not successful in apprehending the robbers after the armed robbery and seizing the cash, it was very difficult afterwards to seize the cash if you couldn't identify it as coming from that particular place. Similarly, with property and investments they made as well, that we were, our hands were tied in that particular regard. And you had the ridiculous situation at times when you had these people who, from whom we had seized money, large sums of money, going back into the courts afterwards, all of us knowing where the money came from, and under a police property application, getting the money restored to them by order of the court. And that's the stroke the monk tried to pull in Northern Ireland. In early 1992, he actually had the audacity to use the law to get his loot back. 
that Cheeky Hood personally appeared in the Belfast High Court and swore that the money he stole from Securicor was lawfully his. Securicor bought an action to have those monies declared not to be the legitimate property of Jerry Hutch, but to belong to Securicor. And we know that Jerry Hutch participated in that uh, case and that he gave evidence. He issued a statement to the court that Lonan Hickey was working as his representative when he lodged the monies and opened the bank accounts in Newry. And he laid claim to the monies that were there. There was no explanation given in Belfast as to the source of the monies. The judge, uh, after hearing all the evidence, adjudicated that on the question of probabilities that the monies in the bank accounts were the proceeds of the robbery in Marino, and therefore Jerry Hutch was not entitled to have them returned to him. Securicor recovered the monies, and Jerry Hutch and his legal team were ordered to pay all legal costs of the case. And there's an interesting anecdote as well, that Jerry Hutch actually appealed this to the House of Lords, but didn't proceed with the appeal. But in the course of giving the evidence, I'm sure with 2020 hindsight, he would have let the money go. But at the time, um, he decided to follow it. The audacious ploy to pull the wool over the law lords also failed. He even contemplated bringing his case before the European court. However, Hutch's instincts told him that it was better to walk away empty-handed. In the end, he would pay for his cheek. He left behind a paper trail that would one day lead to a more costly reversal of fortune. <laughs>